Okay, we are live, perfect shot, starting with you drinking from the beer bottle. Um, unless I totally screwed Cider. up, uh, we, we are live. Uh, good morning, lovelies. It's actually afternoon, but who cares? Uh, this is Ned Karatikas. I am interviewing him. Oh, we got someone, hello. Um, he wrote the fantasy novel Neverstone, which I should have with me physically, but I didn't because I'm actually staying in my parents' house instead of my house. Ned, do you, are you also real? There it is. <laughs> Someone came prepared. Um, yeah, and uh, I did a little one-minute review of it on TikTok. I really liked it. Um, Ned, why don't you tell us just a little bit about Neverstone, uh, what it's about, and what inspired it? Oh, well, I mean, one look at it, you can tell it was started in 2016, but... It's basically, I've been playing Final Fantasy games all my life, and I was sort of in love with the idea that of how they can be an analog for the real world in the way people interact with each other, granted mostly with sword attacks and damage counters, that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. eventually I was like, oh, what if, I'm, what if Cloud was more relatable? And that just sort of devolved into its own thing, finally... It became this, a series about Era Gualtieri. Uh, well, Era, if you hear the audiobook version. There's some inconsistencies, but, you know, that happens with other audiobooks. Point being, right. but this guy, Era, who uh, is starts off as a homeless elf, victim of uh, several war crimes, but just sort of has been solved problems all his life basically and finds out he's the only guy that's legally allowed to save the world from the current dark lord but ends up doing something else entirely and ends up in a sort of urban fantasy environment where mm -hmm. the basically the real dark lord is like capitalism that's the best <laughs> that's the best sort of summary i can have like, for I it. Toxic masculinity that's that's what i was getting well, from it when i read it um, I, I be, the way that I when I was reading it, I thought this is like a parody of epic fantasy novels that is in and of itself an epic fantasy novel. And it's as if Dungeons and Dragons was a video game that you could that people lived in. People were li are living in this Dungeons and Dragons ish video game. Yeah. But it works like it sounds cheesy, <laughs> but it works. Um, yeah, it's. Apparently, when I was submitting it places as a manuscript, I went with, oh, this is a world where that sort of thing happens. And that didn't get a lot of people, but I approached Athon about it. They're like, oh, it's lit RPG. I'm like, what the hell's lit RPG? Oh, I'm the hell's lit RPG. And that's apparently its own genre, started in Russia of all places. And hmm. well, I sort of became a part of it without realizing it was a thing. It's always fun when that happens. Like, oh, oh, I am a genius. I have created this whole new. What do you mean people have already been doing this for decades? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And this is the first book you've published under this pseudonym, Ned Karatikas, um, yes. which is very different from your legal name. Where did Ned and Karatikas come from? Well, Ned is a duck. And I don't know. That appears Ned in the just novel, seems by the way. Like <laughs> Ned just seems like a good name for a duck. And so Karatikus, the last thing is because, well, my name, Dave Hughes, Hughes comes from the fact that I'm Welsh as hell. And uh, Karatikus was an ancient Welsh king who spent basically 10 years or something like that in a single mountain pass defending from the ancient Roman Empire, his homeland, while only wearing a blue G-string, basically. And by the time he finally got betrayed by a queen and then captured, he ended up in the Roman Empire. And Claudius was all like, give me one good reason why I shouldn't murder you and your family. And then he's just like, I'm going to ask you nicely. He's like, fair enough. Here's a home in Rome. <laughs> what, did she betray him because he stole her G-string? I have no... <laughs> oh, great. Now I'm going to be thinking about that. <laughs> Welcome to the channel, Ned. <laughs> um, you mentioned, um, because you do appear in the novel, Ned Karatikas is a self-insert character, uh, a duck, 
that is the scribe to the gods why and also how <laughs> did that happen well if you look on the amazon author bio well a lot of the finer details of it are very spoiler heavy material particularly mm -hmm. ones pertaining to the pale hawk which doesn't really appear until book two when he just sort of mentioned but point being Ned was living in DuPage County, Illinois, in a suburban lagoon somewhere. And, like, you know, next to those suburban plazas with, like, uh, offices and shit. And he made any, after getting his writing degree, he made a very ill placed bet with a god between living between the dimensions. And as part of losing this bet, he has to be the holy scribe for this dimension in particular. I don't know where your mind goes sometimes, but it I'm loving the result. <laughs> oh well. Um uh so I have the the questions for you uh in my little bullet journal here. And so neat I'm, I'm looking down, that's, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bullet journaler. Uh love it. It it works for me. I can't do a regular calendar. Um it just falls apart. Um okay, so there's a lot what did you edit out? Of, I'm almost scared to ask this. What did you edit out of your novel? <laughs> like, because as a writer, like, I know so much gets, you know, like this scene is great, but it's just not going to work for whatever reason. And I'm curious to see, like, what in, in this book where there's, you know, it's like a modernized fantasy where you have, you know, guns that can, Medusa guns that turn people to stone and you have mages with fire out of their eyes that are not afraid to punch a sexist in the face and a priest who constantly says that I need a priest whenever anyone swears or says anything. I that guy. Now, I love Noah, by the way. <laughs> what got cut? <laughs> and the bug demon man, I mean. <laughs> well, for starters, the chosen three was originally a chosen four. Oh, really? Um, you know that character, Leona, you see in the beginning, but only Dorf. the beginning. Yeah, the yeah. Dorf woman, right? She was originally Leonid, and she was going to be one of the chosen four. And mm. eventually I decided, well, her role as a character was not as significant as the others. Well, his, back when she was still a guy. And mm -hmm. part of... His character arc was that, one, he was Branwen's brother, and Branwen only joined the team because she wanted to keep, tra on to keep track of her brother. And right. two, he was part of – his character arc was kind of bizarre. He was a dwarf, but he didn't have a beard, and that kind of has a stigma with it. So he had a plastic mustache that he always tried to pass off as a beard, but it gets melted off at one point. He's like, no, and, you know, just <laughs> – but Leona does come back in book two. Mm. She plays more of a role there. Uh, yeah, because she, she opens by just like totally wasting this, you know, gross guy who like basically is literally trying to kill her just to get, you know, peer pressure points from his other GU buddies who are all just like, yeah, we are the best. And like, they're like, basically the fantasy equivalent of, misogynistic white supremacist douche, douche douchebags and they're trying to legally kill people by dueling them in the cars and she just wastes this guy so i admit i was a little disappointed when she didn't pop up again later huh. um but uh but you you got live too and then um uh, a couple of others. Uh, by the way, if uh, anyone else watching this, if you guys have a question for either myself or Ned, uh, write it in the comments and uh, I will ask them for him. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I've got some here, but we would love to hear uh, any questions that you guys have too. Um, so you mentioned that you started with uh, the like you started with the guy character and then turned him into a girl and then it didn't happen. You also have a ton of other. There's a ton of diversity in this story. You got gender diversity, sexuality diversity. Um, was that intentional and, or did it just happen or did, and did you get any pushback from it? For there it? was, it was a little bit both intentional, both just sort of happened. I mean, Sarastro, the character that shows up later was originally a guy because in the original opera, it was based on the Zauberflote by Mozart. Um, Sarastro was a guy and mm. 
And uh, no. being an inspiration was not something I was prepared to hear for this. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a uh, it's very very loosely based on Dies Alberflota, and Era himself is based on Papageno. But I digress. Oh, this oh, is about that the, the magic flute opera, right? Yes. I saw that opera with my dad. Okay, now I see it. <laughs> Yeah, and and like, uh, of course, it didn't really work out unless I made uh, his uh, uh, his weird imaginary girlfriend into his missing sister. But anyway, right. Point being, this is about the diversity aspect, not the Mozart aspect. Um, yeah, I just I just felt like that. For some of it, it was intentional diversity. For some, most of it though, was just that's what felt right for me, and mm -hmm. that just felt I, I felt it should be in the story. And so you don't have an agenda that you're trying to cram this down, you know, <laughs> poor white suburban American <laughs> roots. Oh, geez. And basically, I have gotten a lot of pushback for that. You you can see the amount of people on Goodreads, especially, particularly some people who are like, oh, this is a this is clearly someone who has their pronouns in their bio. Ew. And <laughs> it's just like. Show? And yeah, it's like, well, I am a he, him, let's be real. And what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, yeah. Th there have been a lot of people saying I'm too political about this. Here's the thing about that. Every story has politics. Freaking mm -hmm. hero slays dragon. Sometimes animal cruelty is justified. That's political. Uh, <laughs> Jolene, uh, monogamy is sacred, political. Um, basically. Lord of the Rings, we, good versus evil. You know, um, women should um, fight. If you're going to, if you're that outnumbered, you should. And you have facing against a guy that literally has a prophecy that no man shall slay him. You should probably start arming your women. It will <laughs> save you trouble. Yeah, people only say it's not. People only say it's too political when it's something they disagree with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I've. <laughs> I've uh, got a, a sci-fi novel that comes out in June 2023. And um, my mom was more excited about it than I am. And she was making that announcement on her author page. And she was saying, uh, one of the commenters was, um, you know, well, I sure hope this book isn't very political. And I'm just like, oh, do I have such bad news for you? <laughs> that, <laughs> like, it's, God, especially if people's, Definition of because like the what people don't seem to get is that the political is the personal like there is no aspect of our personal lives that politics doesn't touch and vice versa. So and I don't consider it a political novel. I consider it a societal novel. Like if you're yeah. talking about social impact, if you're talking about culture, if you're talking about um, the role that religion plays in different like those. Yeah, they're they're political, but they're not political. But people tend to put it under that umbrella. Anyway, anyway, sorry. Segway I mean, over. like. It's if a big enough event happens in Luminar, then it's definitely going to be political because it affects a lot of people at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and it's, I, cause you have um, in Luminar, your world, you've also got three gods who maybe aren't actually gods, but they're powerful enough to basically be considered them. So it's one of, got one of those weird things like, you know, yeah, religion is a huge thing because like they got proof that the gods are right there and that's seriously like a, one of the characters in particular, Noah, who is, you know, I, I love those characters that are like pacifist, but like you put and they're so not necessarily passive, but they're really like, you know, nice and gentle until you really piss them off. And then they just don't hold back. And I that Noah has two of those moments. And I, those are my favorite parts of the book, honestly, is when he goes yeah. off. Here's the thing. The third book, actually, it's a series of four books. And mm. the third book, sort of more or less, the perspective switches to Noah's perspective. And mm. be, the th I will tell you that the titles of the four book, fourth books, um, the title of the fourth is strictly tentative, of course. But right. the next book in the series is called Hero Killer. That's mainly live and era. Um, right. Book three is called Noah the Red. And book four is called The Voice High Most. Okay, yeah, I can I can see that. Um, I got a world building question from Facebook. Um, 
especially when it came to Luminar, did you, it's a world building question. Did you start with something big like Luminar itself and the religion and the guy and the pol political stuff? Did you start big and then work your way down to the smaller stuff? Or did you have start with a couple of details first and then work your way up? That's a funny story, actually, because when this started out, it was actually not Neverstone. It was Final Fantasy, the animated series. And the, the countries were originally like a mix and match from different parts of Final Fantasy history. And when I decided, hmm, this is pretty good. It should be an IP on its own. Then it sort of, I sort of translated from those, but not completely copying, of course. But, right, because there's a difference between fan fiction and fiction fiction. And it sounds like this started almost as fan fiction before it became your own thing, which is fine. That's how most of my books got started. I was actually, it was supposed to be a spec script for an animated series because I have an MFA in screenwriting. Mm. And that just sort of, uh, I was originally, that's how a lot of my projects started. like, oh, I'm going to add something to an IP that already exists. Hey, wait a second. No, I'm not. Yeah, no, for me, it's, um, it's a, well, it starts kind of with a fan fiction -y idea where like, you know, well, what if these two characters from this show or book did this instead of that? Or what happens when they have a kid that is trying to survive in the, with the consequences of their actions or, you know, Coffee shop at you. Exactly. And then, and then, you know, eventually I'll take one of those ideas and take it on another fan -y idea from another story and merge them together and then Frank and take some out and add in the third one and basically I got this whole Frankensteinian shambling monster of a story idea that I more or less works. Yeah, people have a lot of problems with fan fiction, but I'm just like, oh boy, you're gonna have some problems with Dante's Divine Comedy. I know. I mean, the, the yeah, that's a historical fan fiction, and then you also have um, Paradise Lost, which is a fan fiction of the Bible. Um, the and the it is basically a fan fiction of the Odyssey and the Iliad. I mean, we've always had fan fiction. We just now have an actual. Now we just need to legally define it because now we have all the copyright laws and such. Yeah, you know, this isn't actually the first book I've published, but it was the first book I published with another company. Mm. So all your other stuff is self-published. Well, I've only written one self-published book, and that's called Winnie the Pooh and the Angle of Death. And the Angle of Death? Angle of Death. It's a. It's basically a misspelling of Angel of Death, but okay. intentional. It's a horror novel based on Winnie the Pooh. And <laughs> it's under my name, Dave Hughes, not Ned Caraticus. I now have to look this up, and I am scared to now. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's meant to be in the style of A.A. A. Milne, but there is an attempted sex scene, and God is dead anyway. <laughs> <laughs> why did I invite you onto this channel, man? Oh, no, this is why. Okay. <laughs> Asked and answered. Um, yeah, what was I going to... Um, I'm... Do you plot this out? Like, what's your? Do you outline this, or is it pants? Oh, I, I mean, I do a lot of my plotting for stuff um, to everyone's detriment by walking around. I mean, that's kind of that's always been kind of my way of imagining stories by pacing around in a circle and right, yeah, sort of your blood <laughs> some, sometimes talking to myself. It's gotten me kicked out of college a few times, but it's. <laughs> by security but you know it's uh, <laughs> and you when i start taking your walks outside that's 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 how you do that yeah but air conditioning anyway um basically i when i do outline it's very very sparse outlines because i i like i like to actually save the actual writing for when i'm making the word it's making the stuff itself but when I do outlines, it's usually chapter by chapter. Hmm. Yeah, no, my outlines are practically little novels in and of themselves. They're they're chunky and detailed, and I end up having to completely delete and rewrite half of them anyway because I have like a brand new idea and can take the story completely different direction. Relatable. Yeah. Um. 
So your villains, we were talking earlier about diversity um, and like how your main character is basically a cishet, um, basically character of color. Um, best friend, um, the love interest is a, a cishet woman, um, but the other members of the group, we've got um, a transgender paladin who is like really powerful with the shield. You got a, a lesbian barbarian with some um, weird hallucinogenic powers as part of her berserker rage, but like it works. You got this uh, uh, Therastro, the who is actually a queen, but like, so it's a very diverse group and they're going against very anti-diversity villains, the GU, the grownups. And they're like, like I said, they're basically like epic fantasy version of the Proud Boys. That's and pretty much what I was going thinking. for. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I, was just, I can see why people would think that your book is political because, like, it, it really is as if you would just, it, like, if if that type of ideology just got dropped into this world, like, was that a later edition or did you like start with the villains and like what what was your thought process with that? Well, essentially, the, I was going for something that would have been more relatable to our world and the stuff mm -hmm. we got going on at the moment. I mean, you can tell this was written in 2016, or yeah. at least we started then. And I don't know, just something about these realistic problems that it, that it seems like everyone's going to be. It seems like, oh, well, just accept it. It's a part of life. And I don't know. Writing something to the effect of these things, and of no, these things can be stopped, and here's how. Mm -hmm. It was just very, I mean, I feel like reading something like that would be a nice experience for people who have dealt with this sort of thing dealt with on the receiving end of this. But also at the same time, I forget who exactly said this quote, but it's like fairy tales don't tell us that monsters exist. They tell us they can be wiped out or something. Right. Or dropped. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. And it's like the, the main dark Lord, I for Monty. Monty. Um, yeah, he doesn't really scare me all that much because he's kind of an idiot, even though he is the Dark Lord, the, the head of this GU. But his brother, who is <laughs> like number two, the wizard, who like, like right. has a head on his shoulders, he kind of scared me a little bit because it seems to me that he doesn't really believe a whole lot in the GU mission. Um, but he's willing to go along with it anyway because it benefits him. And that I feel is the true villain. It's not really the frothing at the mouth racist and sexist because those are actually in the minority. It's everyone who's willing to work with them or dismiss them because that's just what's best for them. Yeah. Zorik is kind of a complicated fella. He's a, he plays a bit of a large part in book two. Mm -hmm. not, not to spoil or anything, but book two is where er, um, Monty's grudge against Era stops being, oh, it's those damn Rosies. They're ma ruining my life and starts being, I'm going to kill Eric Gualtieri. Because Era actually specifically ruined his life. Um, you also mentioned, like, was it another intentional thing? Because the two brothers, Monty and Thor, don't, like it is explicitly stated a couple of times that they don't have a good relationship with their dad. It seemed that they were okay with their mom, but like their dad's like left the family for an elf. Whereas Era's father, um, even though like they were constantly insulting each other and like, it's like the insults with love. Like I was looking at reading their first interactions, um, Era with his dad. And I was thinking, Oh yeah, that's how I talk to my parents all the time and how they talk to me. Like, that's just, it's, rough but it's a very clear loving relationship there was that another intentional writing symbolism thing or did that just kind of oh yeah this works this this will work it just kind of happened for me i mean personally if you ever seen aqua teen hunger force i cannot unhear misha's voice as carl <laughs> if i ever seen what aqua teen hunger force aqua teen hunger force no you know that cartoon network thing with the talk and shake nope sorry <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I, I, Cartoon Network got a little weird for me, honestly. Understandable. I, I kind of stopped with that. Um, there, there's only so much bizarreness I can take in my life and in my media. Um, <laughs> it's a strange thing that you like this book then. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, small doses. <laughs> no, no. Um, I mean, they do fight a talking taco restaurant, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I kind of almost saw it as an extension of, um, or like a Rick Riordan for adults almost because it struck me as the same style, the same goofy, um, taking the ancient fighting, uh, ancient action adventure fantasy tropes and sticking them in this bizarre modern setting um it just very struck me as very riordanish if you've ever read percy jackson um, i have not read it but i have had a friend who had that as his last name is his first name and he always spelt and he always pronounced it as reardon so i'm like oh oh geez that's actually how you say it i don't know how you say it honestly me neither <laughs> It's like, is it like, it's like, is it Rihanna? Is it Rihanna? I don't know. I've lost track. It's the guy who writes books good. Mm. I mean, like, and like, to be fair, it's like the audiobook version. I love PJ, what PJ Oakland did with it, that, that actor. But mm -hmm. at the same time, some of the decisions, like making the Cauchets sound like Doofenshmirtz, like all of them sound like, like Doofenshmirtz and... <laughs> They just, they just have these, oh, we are the Koshais. We are very German and um, silly German. And, you know, just. I mean, I mean, uh, particularly unsettling, though, is Gregor, because he sounds like Klaus Nomi almost. He's all like, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's for snitching, Charlie. And just. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it fits. <laughs> Yeah, problem. I mean, for Gregor, I always... Who's hallucinating French people. <laughs> I hope For Gregor, though, here's the thing. When I designed Gregor Cache, sort of a larger scope villain, as it were, mm -hmm. he's going to, going to figure more as a villain in book two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. um, it's... When I was just picturing him, I was trying to figure the embodiment of late capitalism in the shell nuts. And when I design characters, I usually go with an idea of, oh, two images plus a mash together. And mm. the two images I chose were a moldy rubber ducky and Jimmy Stewart. So I can and hear him is all like, well, ain't you just proud of yourself? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, the, for those of you who haven't read, um, the Gregor is the, um, emperor of one of the, the king of, the, the king of the province kingdom of Celsior. King of the kingdom and like part of this whole greater conspiracy theory and he's constantly dressed in yellow and gold because like he's, he, like Ned said, very capitalist, metaphorish. Yeah. He basically, he hasn't changed out of the same suit in over 500 years because, oh, a philosopher king does what he wants. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea that the longer someone lives, the more their personality sort of degenerates. I was like, I was exploring the idea of immortality and what it would actually do to the human psyche. Mm -hmm. And yeah, because he is totally batshit, and his and his wife is worse. Like <laughs> she's just Aurelia. so far gone. Like she scared. She honestly kind of scared me sometimes. Like is I was just like, mm, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. I almost feel bad for their son. Just no. <laughs> Oh geez, <laughs> yeah. I I'm going to. Here's what. I, here's the thing about Raphael. I'm only saying this because it's not technically a spoiler if it's in the if it's in the first uh, if it's in the description of it on Amazon. Right. He's gonna die. Yeah. Yeah. That. that <laughs> I can see that. But like, he's like the closest. He's officially the team's mentor. Um, story-wise, though, he's very much kind of almost an antagonist. Um, and he's, like, the closest thing, I think, to a sympathetic villain that you have. Um, and he's not a Killmonger knockoff, for which I'm very grateful. Um, <laughs> I'm so sick and tired of... The, like, I love Killmonger as a villain, but, like, ever since Black Panther blew up, everyone has been trying to do the new Killmonger as their villains, and it oh, just... God not work it doesn't it's like it's like every time it's like the same thing happened when the dark knight came out ever since heath ledger did such a good job of it everyone was all like oh i'm going to make a villain who 
has no motivation and is just an edgy terrorist because it worked for Heath Ledger and God damn it, it could work for me. No, I mean, yeah, no, it's, oh God, there's, I, I don't know if we have even, even have time to like dive deep into like why it works in those, spe- but like it works for those specific stories because it's in those specific stories. They're, it works because they're going against that specific hero and because of their specific personality, backstory, and motivation. That is it. It does not work I mean, for every single story. The only actor that could pull that off was Heath Ledger. And you, you can have a hard time trying to cast him these days. I know. And it killed him. Like, it, Joker killed him. It, yeah. yeah. No, and with Killmonger, everyone... Ugh, no, like, like I say, he was great. But I, I think he was only great because A, he was going against T'Challa, who explicitly had a lot to learn from him. And B... He said that he wants like basically justice for himself and you know all other people of color on the continent, but he's lying to himself. He doesn't want justice. He wants revenge. That's what makes him a villain. He is driven by rage, and that's what you really see when he's shouting at T'Challa and that trans. Anyway, rant over. I am sorry. That's not what we came here to talk about. I kind of did it too. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as uh, I got feelings about i mean and i say this as someone who kind of struggles a little bit to write her villains because i tend to focus more on the interrelationships of the various protagonists but i know when there's a bad villain that i'm reading or watching and uh, everyone is like your villain must be sympathetic every villain must be the hero of their own story neither of those statements are true they can be sympathetic they can be the hero of their own story but they don't have to be and even when they are personally Personally, I just love writing my villains. That's one of my one of the things I have most fun with. I did it's sense like, that, yeah. Because like it seemed to me with the GU, like they were like they think that they're the good guys, but they're still just so evil. Like, and it's a weird dichotomy, but it works for their specific mentality. Like, hmm. oh gosh, yeah. But no, I could definitely tell that you were when I was reading all the scenes with Monty and the other GU guys, their henchmen, like this this guy's having fun. And that shows and it works really well. Because <laughs> if you're not having oh, fun with what are you doing? Yeah, it's like uh, one thing I was I was sort of struggling with when I was writing this is I feel like Sometimes I felt like at least one of my villains should have had a redemption arc, but at the same time with the villains I got set up, some of them are like, you'd be hard pressed to find someone that is redeemable in that group, Mm -hmm. particularly like someone like Monty or something. I mean, there was a plot thread that I was considering in one of the later books about Thoric eventually redeeming himself in some way, but I ultimately scrapped it. Right. So, the closest thing I think, though, is with Titania. Yeah. Yeah. No, and she had, like, centuries. Yeah. And, like, and that's the thing. Like, you can redeem yourself, but it takes a lot of work, depending on how far down that rabbit hole you go. Um, I did like how yeah. you started with, you know, one where he was just, like, during that little trial that, that era sets up on the side of the road. Um, oh, jeez. And that, and that GU guy is like, you know, Israel is just like, oh, wow. I guess, you know, we've all, I've always thought that, you know. Squish. It was, dog dog. <laughs> yeah, it was just like, wow, this guy's been watching Rick and Morty, hasn't he? <laughs> the it's sad thing is I actually hate Rick and Morty. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Man, all right, you know, get off my channel. All right, we're done. Yeah. Actually, and it's I'm just personal good. preference for me, TBH. Oh, yeah, I mean... We yeah, got tons just, of friends who like him. Yeah, it, it can't be... It's not for everyone. A lot of people are surprised that I actually do like Rick and Morty, but I find it hilarious, mm. usually. So this this last season was a little meh, but... I mean, yeah. I you know, I like a, I don't like a lot of unpopular stuff. I mean, I don't like a lot of popular stuff is what I meant to say. <laughs> but it's... I don't know. My interests are very niche. Uh... For example, I'm still a metalhead, and it's 2021, and I don't know. I, I cannot watch Seinfeld because it's basically platonic torture porn. <laughs> I mean, Seinfeld is honestly just stupid. Non-violent. So my parents I mean. always said that, but it it is. It just is. <laughs> Um, all right, so your book, that's that's all the questions that I have. Um, your book, Neverstone, is out. 
book two comes out next month. Yeah, November 23rd. I, well, hang on a sec. I got flyers. It says the exact date. November 23rd, yes. This is my little okay. flyer. It's got Ned. And what's book two called? Hero Killer. Hero Killer. That's why I was saying it wasn't that much of a spoiler. Yeah. Yeah, no. Hero Killer, uh, pre order available on Amazon? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, like uh, the pre order has air and the little, the cover has a little air and a little factory. It's, not much I can give away about that, but it is in a particular, it's going to be a very darker book than book one, considering it deals with some very intense subjects and revelations for some of the characters, particularly about their backstories. And, and all right. book one got a little heavy at times too, but that's good to know. Towards right? the end of I book have... one, you may have noticed an element of uh, potential grooming, as it were. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, that actually gets addressed in book two, and that's sort of the catalyst for why that starts off. Hmm. Well, and I, will put, I will put the pre-order link for book two uh, in the description so people can check that out if they want, as well as the link for Neverstone itself and my uh, TikTok review on it. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for coming for the to the let me try that again. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to the channel, Ned. Um, this is why I usually don't do lives. I, it, you'd be amazed at how much I have to edit out of my videos. I, cause I just can't Understandable. talk. <laughs> Thank you, Ned. And thank you, lovelies. Yeah.